Well, good morning as we uh, come to our passage of Mark 7 and Isaiah 35. Let us come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father God, we thank you for this passage this morning. And may uh, what we have read, uh, Lord God, may you open up the eyes of our hearts that we may see and perceive. And Father, be with this preacher that he preaches your word faithfully and true. And pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, this morning is opened by Christ, for Christ, and for the sake of Christ. And I've handed out a little handout before. Hand out a handout. Um, uh, giving some, giving some ideas together with what's also on the, um, what's on the news sheet. I was, uh, uh, Pat. I was thinking, now how can I get this to you, and how could you incorporate? And I thought, I'll just print something different. <laughs> so, hopefully, I haven't to stolen from your thunder. But um, anyway, did you ever, um, do you ever sing the song to children, or perhaps with grandchildren or even others? Open, shut them. Open, shut them. Uh, that little, what, how does it go after that? Uh, give it a little clap. Open, shut them. Open, shut them. Lay them in your lap. Creep them, creep them, creep them, creep them. Right up to your chin. Open wide your little mouth, but do not let them in. <laughs> I shake them, I shake them also as well. Yeah. Well, this morning we're going to look at open, but from a very different point of view. We're going to be opening ears and unlocking the tongue. And to get to the point, there was, there was, a, a, there was a trip, a rather extensive one in that, and then there was unlocking of the idea that the Messiah has indeed come. And there's many, there have been many who've been praying for this, that they could be uh, praying for this. And there was a man in particular that they've been praying for, that the Messiah would come and heal him. So we're going to be looking at travel, uh, Isaiah 35, and of course that famous word, Ephrathah, be opened. Travel. Well, there are several of our folk who are in some form of various forms of travel now. Now, travelling can be the destination, or you might be travelling to a destination. Depends what you, you take. Either way, travelling is what was necessary. So a, big, a passage begins with travel. Uh, but how far is too far to go for a trip? It seems from Mark's account that Jesus went for a reasonably long trip in distance for a destination that was just across the lake. So from, from our map that we've got, a map from, from what we've uh, got, so Jesus left from around about Capernaum and went all the way up to Tyre and met with that lady and then he went up to Sidon and then he came all the way back down to what is place, what is called the what is called the Decapolis, or what is called uh, the place of ten cities, Polis being city and Deca being ten. It's if we're thinking of it in like uh, around here, it'd be like going from Mount Evelyn down to Portsea, and then along Port Phillip Bay to around about Mornington. And then travelling from Mornington up to Yarra Junction, or something like that. Um, not by car, not by horse, not by bike, walking. That's the distance. That 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 sort of distance that, that that we're talking of. So it's, and I mean, he could have just simply just gone from here to to Yarra Junction. I mean, that would have been still a bit of a distance. But no, let's go down to Portsea, Mornington then to Yarra Junction. That gives you a sense of the, of, of the idea of, of what we're looking at. 
And going to Tyre, Sidon, and then come back to the back to the uh, Decapolis was travelling into and through Gentile ter- territories. Now we know something about Gentile territories and where Jews would walk through and where Jews would not walk through. And so this involves, you know, chapter 7 talks about clean and unclean. So they were going to be walking through unclean areas for a Jew, for a, for a religious Jew to walk through these areas. So uh, they were neither to mix with Gentiles nor they were to travel through their territory. And that's exactly where Jesus goes. And Jesus goes to the places that were deemed unclean, unclean by Jewish law. But Jesus goes there to declare that those lands and the people who live there are not off God's limits. Indeed, the mission of the church is to go to the whole world to make disciples, uh, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's the world is, is, there's no limits to where a Christian gospel, to where the Christian gospel goes. For Jesus was fulfilling what, prophet, the, 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 what, what, what Isaiah prophesied uh, in, in Isaiah 35, that the redeemed of the Lord shall return with joy. So who are the redeemed of the Lord? Well, let's think of Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 is a bit like Romans 8. You can take Romans 8 and say, it's the best chapter out, but you've got to read 1 to 7 to really get the grips of what chapter 8 is all about. Similarly, Isaiah 35, you can read that and thinking, wow, the redeemed of the Lord, yeah, fantastic, that's all good. Not realising that there is judgment of the nations leading up to that point. And then to find that, uh, uh, that when the Messiah comes, certain activities will be happening because the Messiah is present. And one of those is this strange Greek word, and the strange Greek word is called mogalelos, mogalelos, which means the deaf and the dumb. The deaf and the dumb. There's only two places in scripture where you'll find that word. And it's found in Isaiah 35. And guess where else it's found? Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. So in Isaiah 35, it is, it is the deaf and the dumb that will shout for joy. But how can someone who cannot speak shout for joy? Unless, of course, the Messiah has come. Mogalaeus, as I said, appears twice in scripture. And and, and in Mark 7, it describes a man who who Jesus goes to see, who has friends that have reached out to Jesus. Can you heal him? And they are expecting that Jesus may just say a word or perhaps may lay a hand on him. But Jesus has compassion on this man and brings him aside to heal him in a most unexpected way. Now, the man lives in what is this, this place called the place of ten cities. And we must remember thinking, now, I've heard of, I've heard of, Mark's mentioned Decapolis before. Who else came from or who else went to the Decapolis? And we're scratching our brains thinking, I remember where it is, I remember where it is. And then we remember it was the man who is possessed by so many demons in a graveyard that Jesus went straight across the the lake and and commanded all of the demons to come out of that man and then they went into the pigs and the pigs went into the... Remember that? Remember that thing? He wanted to follow Jesus. That man wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to get in the boat with Jesus. And Jesus said, no... Go back to the place where you came from. Go back to the Decapolis, the places of the ten cities. And talk about what you have seen and what has happened to you. 
So it's extraordinary that this man, freed from, uh, freed from legion of, of demons, has now been in Decapolis, the place of the ten cities, and been talking all about Jesus. So what does J Jesus do with this man? This man who, who all these friends have gathered around and realised that he was this friend who is unable to speak and unable to hear, but unable to hear and then unable to speak properly. Well, Jesus opens his, his ears and releases his tongue. As I mentioned before, this, this word is found both here in Mark 7 and then also, and also in Isaiah 35. And the allusion to, to Isaiah 35 is of supreme significance. For in Mark's presentation of Jesus, not only because the restoration of speech to this man who was deaf and dumb signals the arrival of the day of the Lord, but also because of the desert wastelands of Lebanon will receive the joy of God. When we look at the map, we go Tyre and Sidon, which are, of course, precisely what Lebanon is, the places of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus has gone into Lebanon to pronounce pronounce the the glory of God and and uh, and in that place in Sidon an entire sorry entire it was that it was that woman who came to him about her daughter and then it's moving up to Sidon and it's coming back down to back down to those ten cities that the fruit the first fruit of fulfillment of Isaiah 35 that the that uh, that the Gentile Lebanon will join the ransom of the Lord and enter Zion with singing. So salvation thus comes to the Gentile world in Jesus, who is God's eschatological redeemer from Zion. Wrap your lips around that one and see how you go. God's eschatological redeemer is who Jesus is. And then Mark highlights the empathy of Jesus for the man with his hearing and speech impairments. And by himself needy, the needy man simply uh, could be just another face within, within a crowd of Gentiles. Just another face. Just, do you know how you walk down, if you go into Burke Street Mall, apart from the trams running through it, but you go into Burke Street Mall and there's so many faces, there's so many people, there's crowds of people all around the place. Jesus could have just gone through, but he signalled this one man out and had compassion on him. And Jesus puts his fingers into the man's ears and then he spits and touches the man's tongue. And by touching the man, Jesus repeats his radical identification with the needy and sometimes ritually uh, unclean people. It's been suggested that the physical contact is really an expression of Jesus' compassion. Love seeks intimacy and the touch of Jesus is a tangible prelude of the fellowship of believers, uh, of the fellowship of believers' experience with him through faith. Um, that's quoted in, uh, from uh, Slater, who is quoted in James Edwards' commentary. It, it is extraordinary. It, it is this extraordinary optic and thought to ponder. In what ways has Jesus touched you? When were those moments that seem almost so long ago, but you can remember it as if it was yesterday? For myself, I remember vividly the evening when Christ became real to me. And I was with a group of church folk at a camp in Belgrave Heights, not too far from here. And I incorrectly thought that I had to get Jesus to like me. Like, I had to get him to, like, 
Anyway, so I was doing things that I thought would make Jesus like me. Uh, I was just being a pain in the neck. Um, what is correct, though, is that Jesus accepted me just as I am. I didn't need to try and press Jesus. I was trying, I was trying really hard and being a pain in the neck. But what I needed to know was I just need to be Christ's own child. That's all I needed to know. Instead of trying to be making a big impression. I needed to love Jesus because Jesus loved me first and that thought blew my head off similarly when we consider Jesus with this man and touching the man's tongue with spittle with like spit some have suggested that uh, bodily, bodily excretion, uh, spittle, normally fall into the category of unclean body fluids. Like you see people spitting on the ground, you're thinking, ooh, odd. However, it's considered by Jews to have a healing power, especially when it's accompanied by the formula of prayer. So maybe my mum was right when she used to put spit onto her handkerchief. Come here, Miles, and I'll wrap you off and pop this off. Really? You have to do that here? Oh, goodness me. You see, Jesus doesn't minister from a safe distance, but he looks to heaven and deeps and sighs and, and heaves with a deep sighing, saying, Ephaph Atha for which Mark gives the translation, be opened. The anointing of Jesus' spittle might be considered um, uh, all sorts of things. But the cure for this was not so much the spittle. Yes, it was important. And it wasn't the miraculous sign. Yes, it was important. But there wasn't a magical power attached to it. Absolutely not. But it was Jesus' intimate compassion for this man and the authority of his word. Be open. Be open. Unlock the tongue. Open the ears that he may hear. So let's think about Ephrathatha, be open. Open, well, that's a really interesting word, isn't it? We pray for all sorts of things. We pray for open ears. We pray for open hearts. We pray for borders to be open to the gospel. So the gospel can be taken into those territories. But sometimes the, the borders are closed to the gospel. But the gospel still goes in. The gospel still goes in. Because there are hearts there who, who, are, who are wanting to open it, who wanted to be here, the, the gospel spoken. So where borders are closed, we pray for hearts to be open, for ears to hear, for mouths to, to speak the truth of the gospel in ways that are new but equally as old as well. It's extraordinary when we, when we study through the book of Acts and go through the book of New Testament, we find that wherever the apostles, and um, including Paul here, preached, there are some who believed in, in new territories where the gospel had not been preached before, and yet there are other places where, where um, people did not receive the gospel, and yet they became quite violent towards Paul and the apostles. So how we understand and why some remain dead in their trespasses and while some believed. The answer why some did not believe and 
as Acts 13 suggests, uh, or not suggests, uh, states that they thrust it aside. It's because the message of the gospel to them was folly to them. Now, I know that all of us can, can tell of our own experiences of when we have come across people who have thrust the gospel aside and said, I don't want anything to do with those stupid words. Only to find later on that they become believing Christians. Maybe it's because they were not able to understand and that the mind of the, f mind of the flesh is hostile to God for it does not want to submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And in everyone who hears and rejects the gospel, as Jesus spoke in John chapter 3, hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. And they remain, uh, in Ephesians 4, they remain darkened in their understanding because of, their, because of ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. And Romans 1.18, it, 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 it is not an innocent ignorance. It is a guilty ignorance. The truth is available, but by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. So why then do some believe, since all who are, all, since, since all are in this condition of rebellious hardness of heart, dead in their trespasses, as we have read constantly? And maybe the book of Acts gives us some answer at least. One is that they are appointed to believe. In Acts 13, we find that when Paul preached in, Paul preached in Antioch in Poseidon, the Gentiles rejoiced, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Extraordinary way of being described, isn't it? Another way of answering why some believe is that God granted repentance. And when the, the saints in Jerusalem heard that the Gentiles, and not just Jews, were responding to the gospel, they said, then to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life in Acts chapter 11. But maybe the clearest answer in Acts to the question why a person believes is what we started our service with, Lydia. Why did she believe? Well, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by, said by Paul. You know, if this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus, then all these things happen to you. You were appointed to believe. You were granted to repent. And the Lord opened your heart. And the rest, of your, the rest of your life, you should be lived overflowing with the amazed thankfulness at the miracle that you are indeed a believer. In all of this, we agree with the comment made by the friends of this, of this man who is deaf and mute when they talked about Jesus in verse 37, they said, people were overwhelmed, overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute and the mute speak. This is true. This is indeed true. This is indeed true in our lives. For, uh, for from we have heard, um, because we have had our hearts opened and our eyes are, and our ears unblocked and our minds opened to scripture. Christians are not closed minded. The world likes to think that we're closed minded. Only because their minds are closed to, to the scriptures. This is a new beginning. It is a new beginning, is it not? 
a new a new action, um, a new life has been born within us. We were we are no longer dead in our sins. We were once dead, but now we've been made alive. As as Paul would write that that we were once dead, but now we we are alive. And and Jesus said to to um, in John three, um, Nicodemus, thank you. Jesus said to Nicodemus, "You must be what again." born again to which the teacher of Israel said how can I be born again like my mum's dead so how's that going to work it's a spiritual it's a, it's, it's a our soul is regenerated to use that word that, that very big theological word what was once dead is now alive so Give thanks to God. He has done all things well. When these people said this about the man who was deaf and mute and they were overwhelmed, this is the language of Genesis chapter 1, that God said it was good. And the concern of creation, man, it was very good. This is a new creation. This is a new beginning. This is a regeneration. Something significant has happened to this man. It's just the same as something significant happened in your life that you were appointed to believe, that you were granted repentance and that the Lord opened your heart that you may believe. If Fafatha, be open. You know, Christ is the beginning of the new creation. And friends, can I say that is what Isaiah 35 looks forward to. A new creation where the redeemed of the Lord walk on the open highway of holiness. The passport for walking on this, on this road, on this way, as Spurgeon once said, the passport is the seal of Christ. As we walk, let us keep Isaiah 35 in our minds. So, our hands, our feeble hands, strengthen them, O Lord. Our knees that we constantly give way to, steady our knees and say to those fearful hearts, when we tremor at night, at the, at, the, at, at the fourth watch. Be strong and do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush from the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground bubbling sound, uh, springs. In the haunts where jackals lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. This is a picture of, of new life. Completely different to what we see now. And a highway will be there, and it is called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk, it will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not be will not go on it. No lion will be there, nor there will be any ferocious beast get up onto it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed in the Lord. Redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will, will return. And they will enter Zion with singing, and everlasting joy shall, shall, shall crown their heads. Gladness and joy shall overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come in singing unto Zion an everlasting joy be upon their head for Christ has done all things well
Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father God, we, we pray, O oh Lord, for an opening of hearts through what, we, what is happening here in this church, through our relationship we have with our family and our friends, that not only will Bibles will be opened, but hearts will be opened and truths realised in their life. Father, this is our prayer this morning. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Lord, be my vision.